that's gonna be a lot of uh, Russian passports they're gonna be giving out. Isn't it insane how quickly they're doing this? Like in the middle of an invasion? Would they have just put f***ing like Stalin on there and say like, how f***ing shameless? Bro, would they have just remolded into her like a, a Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin little f meme? Jesus. All right, segment, let's go. It's been a year since Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, it has absolutely not gone the way that they expected. You laughed in the face of your last year <laughs> um, on this issue. <laughs> Thanks for the gifted tier one sub, meat fucker. Um, they expected to roll Kiev in like less than a week. That didn't happen. The convoy got fucking smashed. They've had to adjust their goals to some kind of, I don't know, nebulous uh, victory that no one can really pinpoint. In September of last year, they annexed uh, Donetsk, Luhansk, as well as the Kherson and uh, Zaporizhia region. But in the meantime, Ukraine has managed to claim back just over half of the land that was lost since 2022. The other half looks like it'll be harder to reclaim just because of uh, the Dnieper River and because of Russia managing to like fortify the areas that they do have. It looks like they're trying to hold on rather than push. Um, Crimea, uh, it's surprisingly not off the table, even to the United States. The, the US State Department has not said Crimea is going to be impossible. Um, no, they're also saying it's not going to be anytime soon, so, you know. Uh, polling suggests that um, even recent polling, there was one result that came out today that says, like, at least, like, something like between 85 and 90% of Ukrainians want to just keep on fighting until they win. I think the number's actually gone up since this poll. Even in the East, we're above 50% in the East and the South. Even though this is actually when... Um, this is actually where the bulk of Ukraine's refugee population has come from, which means most of the people who would be um, opposing Russia's presence in these areas have fled. Not most of them, but like, yeah, a lot of them will have fled. Or um, either been captured by Russians and taken back to fucking taken to Siberia is one uh, rumor. Or also just, uh, yeah, just fled as refugees. So, yeah, Ukraine is still pretty much on the, uh, got Russia on the back foot. It's really hard to say what's going to happen next. Um, but in the meantime, it looks like they're reclaiming land. They're going to continue trying to. And yeah, good on them, to be honest. I wanted to look at one of these videos, though, especially um, because it hasn't been reported on quite a while, is what actually happened in Mariupol. Because what happened in this uh, city was just such a good example of uh how quickly russia is working and just how imperialism works as well um people might think that russia was just like they decided to raise mariupol to the ground out of like frustration or callousness and all that and actually an alternative reason for them doing it is actually that it was quite calculated that one of the uh reasoning uh, for them doing that what they did in mariupol was not just because they were struggling to gain control of the city because of the uh the Azovstal uh, steel plant being very well fortified, but actually just because they want to rebuild this place in Russia's image. And they've already started. So Mariupol is like a, it's like a 300 year old city. Um, I think something between like 85% to 90% of the buildings have either been damaged or completely destroyed. Um, and Russia is now carrying out demolitions. You can see the map here, two and a half thousand buildings sustained damage, which is nearly half, well, nearly half, sorry. You can see the timeline of the destruction. So that's from f beginning of the war. Also, um, if you're one of those cucks who thinks Crimea was justified because of the ethnic Russian population and because of the Black Sea and because they have boats there, uh, one really, really good ex argument against Crimea, apart from all the obvious ones about imperialism and shit, is that what made it so easy for Russia to get over here was because they had Crimea, because they militarized the fuck out of Crimea and it gave them access to, into Ukraine through the south, as well as just the east and the north. So that's what happens. Crimea was not only annexed for uh, ethnic reasons or for historical reasons. 
It was also annexed for military reasons. This all happened in, uh, what, between February and May. And it turns out there are already plans, these are Russian plans, for rebuilding the city. This is a design document uh, by the Russian site, The Village, and they've got planning phases for 25, 2030, 2035, so they are... They are hoping to keep this place. They are really pushing to keep it. And I would imagine, so what they usually do in places like Transnistria or um, Abkhazia or South Ossetia is what they'll do is, um, if they haven't done this already, they're going to be giving out Russian passports and they're going to be giving out incentives for ethnic Russians to move in here as well, to cement the demographics and the population. Um, Hunter Avalon, thanks for the raid. I hope you had a good stream. We're just learning about Russia's imperialistic ambitions for Mariupol. Um, it's very likely they're going to rename a lot of these streets to like Lenin something or add lots of, um, what was it, Ova and shit to what? Yeah, like they're going to russify the names of everything. They've done like a little street design guide. Pretty minute detail. In case anyone's ever wondered as well, why the fuck would you join the Azov Battalion? The Nazi Battalion? Why would, why would you ever do that? Well, in 2014, if you joined Azov, it might very well have been because you liked the weird fucking training camps and you had Nazi sympathies and you liked the Black Sun and you liked their leader, Belitsky, and all that. The reason people who might have uh, joined the Azov Battalion a bit later on, say last year, is because they were the ones who were defending the city. They were a big part of the defense of Mariupol. And they were the reason it took Russia so long to secure full control of the place, because they uh, were able to hold the Azov-style plant. They also did keep Russians out in 2014. I'm just saying that 2014 was also when they were a lot more Nazi-esque than they are now. Like they, Their Nazi leader was there, and yeah, they were smaller. Um, whatever. Thanks, Meatfogger. Thank you for being so fucking on point not letting me rest for a single minute. All right. Ooh. So yeah, that's probably one pretty big reason people might have been inclined to join the Azov Battalion at this point, other than being a Nazi. So it's a story about someone. I guess we can do this. Karina Gurnak was living with her grandmother in the outskirts of Mariupol when the Russian invasion began. She went to stay with a friend in the city center thinking it would be safer. On 13th of March last year, a shell exploded outside her building. The shrapnel went straight through one of her legs and became lodged in the other. Whilst Karina was being driven to the hospital for emergency care, their car came under fire. Also, the reason um, so many of the civilians of Mariupol were able to get evacuated, also because of, in part, the Azov Battalion. Um, whilst Karina was being driven to the local hospital for emergency care, their car came under fire. Her friend's father behind the wheel was hit five times, but they made it safely. Doctors treated Karina's injuries, and after three days, they left Mariupol through one of the evacuation corridors. She eventually made it to Spain. Weeks later, she made contact with her family. During that call, she found out that her father had been shot dead by a Russian sniper. The picture here is the last one they would take together. Her brother was alive, but had not been taken to Russia in one, uh, in one of the evacuation buses. But had been taken to Russia. Oh, and to Russia? Ooh. Her mother and grandmother still live in Mariupol and speak to Karina when the internet is strong enough. The neighbors helped my grandmother to cook and mom also somehow, so they were scraping along, surviving. One could say I took the heaviest blow. Thank God. Well, and this looks like one of the reasons for leveling a lot of these blocks was to make room for new buildings. This is also, that's the theater. Um, that's where they also had, um, they'd written uh, kids or children in uh in russian on the outside so that they could be seen from the air because they were holding about a thousand people in there sheltering them and russia blew it up anyway the old drama theater yeah one thousand civilians sheltering in there and that's yeah that's the writing in cyrillic where they wrote children is this story Alevtina shvitsova is a former resident of mariupol she has fled to lviv in the west of ukraine she has watched what has been happening to her city in sorrow and fury. It's being done deliberately. They're trying to hide their crimes and change history, she told me. Mariupol has a massive amount of needs. People remain without heating, without water. Some of them still live in the buildings that were destroyed. Whoa. Um, but the occupiers destroy the historical monuments as a priority 
and do it in a provocative, cynical way with elements of Russian propaganda. Her house was a short walk down the road from the historical theater. Clock house. Oh, and there it is now. I was hit by a Russian missile strike on the same day as the theater. Oh, yeah. Have they changed Peace Avenue to Lenin Avenue? <laughs> I love the. It's like they're not even trying to. It's, it's like almost poetic. Peace? Nah, mate. Lenin. It's so funny as well how, like, Russians pretend to give a fuck about Lenin still to this day. It's like so much of that kind of uh, Soviet shit um, when it comes to Russia is like, I, I don't understand why a leftist would sympathize with this, like make any excuse for it. Like the reason people like Lenin in Russia is not because of the theory or the socialism or anything like that. They like Lenin because he uh, built an, he like laid the foundations to build an empire. It's also the same as like the whole World War II thing and people like celebrating the Soviets because they defeated the Nazis and everything. Well, in Russia, it's not like the fact that they defeated Nazism is not the thing that they really care about. It's the, it's the fact that they won. It's like, a, it's, like not, it's like a military triumphalism like rooted in national chauvinism. That's what it's about. It's not about defeating the bad guys or the fascists or anything like that. Like, they don't give a fuck about that because they actually have like, <laughs> uh, the typical Russian nationalist actually has quite a lot in common with fascists. This was the clock tower. Russian companies building on the ruins of Mariupol. They're going to re-image Azov style as a tech and eco park. Wow. Designed by, uh, the master plan was signed into official decree in July um, by Denis Pushilin, the nominal head of the Donetsk People's Republic, the separatist movement that was subsequently and illegally annexed by Russia. It's a blueprint for the entire city that runs up to 2035, projecting a rise in population from 212,000 people in 2022 to 500,000 then. That's going to be a lot of uh, Russian passports they're going to be given out. Look at this. Isn't it insane how quickly they're doing this? Like in the middle of an invasion? <laughs> okay. But this is actually like a really good insight into how imperialism works because the whole point about um, colonialism or imperialism is they have to do their carry out their actions to make sure that whatever they're doing, like the land that they've claimed and uh, conquered, it, the point is, is to make it as irreversible as possible, right? So you rename a bunch of the street names to cement some kind of like ethnic and cultural identity. You uh, replace all the buildings to build it in your image. If you, you know, have, if you want to take the buildings down, you make sure you move in a lot of your own people there and give out your own passports so that there's a demographic claim over it so that you can say that like, well, democratic will um, says we should be here. It's exactly what they did with Crimea as well. There's a very good reason that Russia, since the 1700s, have been, to the late 1700s, have been moving Russians into Crimea. They never stopped. They did that way, way before 1944. Because in the 1700s, the Tatar population of Crimea was like, like 80, 90% of them were Tatars. That's been a very like gradual process of like either kicking them out periodically or just like allowing them to die of starvation, like during the Holodomor and shit like that. Um, and then just replacing them with Russians. It's like a very common tactic. And then, yeah, also, like, think about what they did in eastern Ukraine. Like, how much of the argument for uh, Russia going into eastern Ukraine was because there are ethnic Russians there. There's a very solid, like, Russian identity there. Well, there's a, the reason there's a Russian identity there is because Russia put it there. <laughs> like, because, because they russified the place over a period of, like, hundreds of years. And again, after the Holodomor, it was mostly eastern Ukrainians who died. And, they, and after they died, um, Russia replaced that population as well by moving in a bunch of Russians and Belarusians. Projections will take another 12 years to reach Mariupol's pre-war population. Okay. There's the theater district. All right. There you go. Some of the first buildings to be erased in the city have been symbols of Ukrainian identity. It's not really an accident. That's a Holodomor memorial, isn't it? 3233. Yeah. 
Oh, look at that. Just up the road from uh, Albertina Shetsvova's house was a famous mural of a small girl. Her name is Milana. She lost her leg and her mother was killed after an indiscriminate rocket attack in the city in 2015, launched by rebel and Russian forces, according to the Ukrainian authorities. The monument was a symbol of resistance, of hope, to those living in her shadow. In autumn, it began to be covered up. By winter, all trace had gone. Russian colors had taken her place. That's so fucking grim. Ugh! The victors in war have always used symbolism to buttress their claims to sovereignty, but cultural rights are protected under international law, even during conflicts. So that's the old picture of her, and they've replaced it with this. Bro. Fucking kidding me. Like, where is the uh, statue of the Holodomor girl? It's in Kiev. Bro, you know what they would have done, right? This statue. You know what they would have done if they took over Kiev? Would they have just put f***ing, like, Stalin on there and stuff? Like, how f***ing shameless. Bro. Would they have just remolded into her, like, a, a f***ing Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin little f meme? Jesus. Russia and the Donetsk People's Republic are making the most... It's, it's amazing that they've actually given it that, that... That's what it's called now. Like, people are just naming it that since the annexation. Oh, they're cutting the little red fucking... Bro, these dipshits have no idea, do they? Bruh, what we got here? Oh, this is their uh, is this their plans, or is this some? Yeah, that's a bit of a before and after over there. Oh god, this is such a good graphic by Sky News. Holy shit! Some of the quickest buildings to be put up are not for civilians. A military base has been built here. The slogans painted on the roof translate to "From the Russian Army for the Citizens of Mariupol." Okay. Through all of this, those still living in Mariupol struggle to survive. For all the Russian boasts of restoration, many still live in bombed out buildings without water, without heat or electricity in the freezing winter. And more immediately than the rebuilding, they are subject to other methods of control. In so-called filtration camps, residents are questioned by authorities, a method of identifying those who might pose a threat to the Russian-backed regime. Schools are being reconstituted with teachers sent for training in Russia and Ukrainian textbooks swapped for Russian ones. Children have been encouraged to join military training. Karina has been watching the transformation of her home from afar. I have a cousin who is in Mariupol. He attends a Russian school now, and he says, We're taught everything new. We're taught about everything Russian. The Russian anthem. All the textbooks are in Russian. So unfortunately, the stage of destroying Ukrainian culture and the culture of Mariupol in principle, unfortunately, this stage has already been passed. We asked the government of Donetsk People's Republic, the Russian Ministry of Construction, and Petersburg Renaissance for comment, but received no reply. Karina is at least safe. Her leg is healed, thanks to the Ukrainian doctors who helped her as she fled. But all she can do is wait. Who can say for how long? Whoa. What a good graphic thing from Sky. Like, it's just so insane how quickly they do that, though. F*** me. I guess re-education went out of style. We're going to filtrate. Why would you call it filtration camps? God. It just makes me think of liquidation. <laughs> like, filtration. Why didn't they just call them denazification camps? They're so good at courting, like, online leftist approval. Fuck. Anyway.